tell me. Hello, everyone. I am Lauren Konkar Sheehy, the Executive Director of the Garden State Film Festival. And with me is David Schoner, Associate Director at the New Jersey Television and Motion Picture Commission. I think I said that backwards. You did, but it's did. still right. And we're super excited to have Rick Cook joining us from Philadelphia. Hi, Rick. Hey, how are you guys? Good, thanks. Doing well. So we're here to talk about the short that you created with Hunter called Life in Kensington, Philadelphia, through the lens of Jeffrey Stockbridge. Rick, how did this project come to be? First of all, you're amazing. Not only with your still photography, but obviously I'm a huge fan and very proud of you. But how did this project, but also I know that you and Hunter kind of have a series of these shorts that you're doing. So tell us all about that. Yeah, so me and my friend and collaborator, Hunter Sita, um, a few years ago, we were hanging out, uh, just skateboarding. We used to do a lot when we were even just a few years younger. Um, and we, we really wanted to start <laughs> shooting um, some some small documentaries about different artists and um, kind of creatives in the Philadelphia area that we knew. Um, and we started reaching out to some people and, you know, over the years we've kind of grown like this little collection of short documentaries. Um, we've done rock climbers, jazz musicians, costume artists. Um, and Jeffrey Stockbridge is a photographer based in Philadelphia that we knew because we were renting a studio space to kind of put together these these uh, small documentaries and just work out of. And he was actually our, our landlord. But inside, you know, our space was part of a big um, sort of like collective art studios. And inside you know, his space was a photography studio. And every time we'd go in, pay the rent, we'd see these massive portraits <gasps> of just people from Kensington, which is like a really um, interesting neighborhood in the city. It's a working class neighborhood uh, that's been hit really hard by the crack epidemic and then now the opioid epidemic. Um, and he's been, you know, shooting these portraits and doing these little um, kind of bios on people living in the streets of Kensington for, for a few years now. I'm not sure exactly when he started, but, uh, you know, we knew from the second we, we saw these pictures that we wanted to document what it is he's doing. And it just took a few years for us to kind of get to know him and, and, you know, for the whole thing to come together. But we ended up shooting it, I think we shot in 2019. Oh, cool. Um, in the dead of winter, which uh, we didn't know at the time. It was actually the, the, ex the winter that the city of Philadelphia decided they were gonna crack down on the people living in the streets. Oh. The city. So we came in kind of like at the last moment, actually the last day that it was really possible to shoot something like this. Oh, wow. That's yeah. So cool. And how is the process of recording if they were cracking down? I mean, you, you're, the footage is amazing. So you really captured it, but was it, a, did that make it a little more difficult? In a way, yes, but in a way, no, because we were in a pretty dangerous area, an extremely <laughs> dangerous area. There was a lot of uh, open air drug dealing going on. There was, you know, a lot, there's prostitutes in the area. There's uh, gang members. Um, and we, the day that we show, we went with Jeffrey to shoot some, some video under one of the bridges, uh, the city was there with a tons of police, uh, a huge police presence, and they were kind of moving people out. So I think in a way there was some security having officers in the area. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure that carrying around, you know, $20,000 or the camera equipment would have been a great idea on a normal day, but it just so happened that that day there was, um, you know, a lot of other people present. Oh, good. And Shona was commenting on how beautiful every shot is. Oh, thank you. Each each frame when you I'm and I can't wait for people to see this. Mm -hmm. Each frame 
is this beautifully composed moving image. It's as if a, it's a still image that is moving and it's not distracting. And I don't mean that even in the slightest way. It's like, no, it's, it's beautiful. And it's really just tells a fantastic story. I think, I mean, I'm glad that you, you see that in it because I think part of the approach to this project being that we were documenting a photographer mm -hmm. was to make the imagery almost like still images to kind of, in a way, replicate Jeffrey's work in a moving image. And if you haven't checked out Jeffrey's work, the website is Kensington Blues, uh, kensingtonblues.com. Um, and you can really see where there's these like very, very intimate, large format portraits wow. with these people. And um, with all of the portraits, he accompanies them with um, either captions and descriptions of the moment that he was capturing or interviews and sometimes even audio interviews with those people in those moments. So there's a couple of shots in our film where we, we were just kind of pr approaching it the way that he approaches it, where we would, we would have a discussion about someone about their current situation and then just do a video portrait and just a still image of them looking in slow motion. Um, and I, I, hopefully it was, it was as powerful as his images are. It is, it is as powerful. I do. I'm not saying that lightly. It is, it is brilliantly done in a way that you completely, uh, got that image, got that message across about this photographer in what you were documenting. You, you feel it and can see it. And then Rick, I think also the fact that I know that you shoot black and white photography, Rick, you're back. Yes. Oh, good. We lost you. You're we back. Just... Yeah, you left okay. too. Oh, dang. <laughs> um, so I think that also that, you know, you look through the lens in both capacities, photo, still image, as well as cinema. I think that that is huge. And you feel that with each image, like David said, in this piece. I mean, in all your pieces, but specifically this one. Yeah, I, tr I try to shoot a lot of still images. I haven't lately, but... Um that's really just a hobby. I don't do it professionally, but in a way it's just kind of a way to train yourself. I feel to, to look at the meaning behind an image more than just set up like a, a video shot. One of, one of the things I wanted to comment, I think that works is that um, you're talking about people that could are forgotten and are, mm -hmm. um, you know, are underrepresentative, any that stuff. And so what you've done is in the images that you've captured, these video images that you've captured, you are helping tell their story and you're involving us in their stories. And I think that's the beauty of it in a real, a very strong way. It, it's, that's important because they, they are, they, you know, they are important. Yeah, there's a lot of lost people on the streets of Philadelphia. And um, if you just drive through that neighborhood, it's unavoidable. You turn down every corner and there's somebody living in a tent. You turn, you know, it, it's people living in just horrible situations. There's like a housing crisis going on in the city. It was highly publicized over the pandemic of people living on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. Um, and that was, that's a huge part of what Jeffrey does. He, he tells the stories of these people um, and he does that. It, he's, he's intending to put the images of these people in these terrible circumstances in front of the people who would easily just turn a blind eye. Right. Mm -hmm. And that could be politicians, that could be other activists, um, the people in charge of housing and the people in charge of you know, handling this crisis. He takes these images of, of these really horrific, but yet beautiful images of humanity, and he puts them in front of them. And it's kind of unavoidable. You can't stand in a room with a bunch of portraits that are like four feet tall, right, looking right in front of you and, and just say that you can't see the problem. Right. right. And there is something to be said with that when you talk about that size of the image. Mm -hmm. You can't walk away. You can't yeah. not look. And that's, and that's important the, and when you're trying to highlight these these people, these underrepresented people, these people that are on the edge, you, by having the images that large, you are forced to look at them and acknowledge them. Totally. Rick, let's talk a little bit about your background and how you got into video and film production. Was, was there anyone important in your uh, path? Would anyone help you that we know of? Yeah, so many people, a lot of people. 
Yeah. Um, Lauren, Lauren being one of them. Um, I started getting into this when I was a teenager. I would film some little movies with my friends. Uh, we had our own little production company. We'd buy gear whenever we could. Little cheap video cameras, mini DV cameras back in the day. And uh, when I graduated high school, I went to, I ended up going to Brookdale Community College and I took some television courses there. I got involved with the television station um, and I started kind of volunteering, eventually ended up working there and just using that time to live a very modest college boy life. Awesome. Life. And, uh, you know, really just learn as much as I could over at Brookdale. Lauren was there, uh, Sergey, Jen. Matt, Matt Montemorano, Chad Anderson, everybody really over there just kind of, everybody taught me something different. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily exact, like, so I'm a cinematographer now, full-time cinematographer. Back then I was learning things from producers, editors, and just picking up little bits and pieces and really just trying to find my way. Mm -hmm. But ultimately it was like all really useful because now when I'm shooting, I know a lot about, you know, what an editor might want, producers, you know learning how to work with directors, just kind of learning collaboration. And this is a very collaborative business and, yeah. and it's fantastic that uh, Brookdale gave you that. It really is because it's very important. I love it. When I was just confirming, <laughs> just confirming. Yeah, no, I mean, those, those years really, I can't under, or understate how valuable they were to me. It was, I was really, really, aside from just like the obvious, not having any kind of debt from those years, but also just being, um, you know, out of smaller school, I think was a huge benefit. I always thought I would go to like NYU when I was in high school. I thought that was like my path. I'd mm -hmm. be the NYU filmmaker, but it wouldn't have worked out. I wouldn't have lasted. I wouldn't have enjoyed it. No, but I think in a, an important piece with Brookdale and Brookdale Television is that we are really there and allow you to kind of get your feelers to see, okay, I'm, we knew with you, you were definitely interested in lenses and cameras and all that. And like, we gave you the tools and resources to do that, to kind of just, you know, we, we did make you edit some stuff, whatever, and go through different things. But like, we knew immediately, like this kid was making different lenses in high school right? and stuff like that. So you're one of our proudest student alumni. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, that's a really a big deal when you think about when you're going towards something like this in the arts or, or in this type of entertainment business is having the ability to really concentrate if that's where your passion is and that's mm -hmm. where you really want to go is to be able to concentrate in that and have the accessibility to it. And sometimes when you're in a bigger community, uh, that could be a, uh, even a more detriment because it's not uh, conductive. It gets it, lost. Yeah, it gets I mean, lost. Like we know the students' names and everything. You're not just an ID number. But Rick, I think it's important that you mentioned how many different experiences you had from the producer and director and all that because I feel like students now, not just now, but they come in and they're like, I want to direct. But guess what? Mm -hmm. You can't direct because you don't know anything. You need to know this, that, and that first before you can get to that stage. So it's nice and important to hear, you know, your whole path has made you into who you are now and I am just happy. Yeah, I think it's um it's common for people to enter film school school or even a community college and like you said they want to direct. Well, you know, they can direct, mm -hmm. but they might not have the understanding of like David said like how collaborative this is. You can direct a project but that doesn't you don't you don't want to be directing something and be the camera operator the cinematographer the sound mixer yeah. the editor you can't you can't really get far doing it all on your own you can but that project you know it's easy to get blinded by like your own ideas if you're not collaborating or learning the process of working with other people i think going to brookdale one of the huge benefits was i was the only i would say cinematographer yeah at the school for the entire time I was there. So mm -hmm. I had like a luxury of like all of these students coming in that want to direct, I could shoot their projects for them. Mm -hmm. And that was like, while they might make two projects while they were at Brookdale, I, m I made probably easily 20. Right. Um, and got, you know, different experiences working with different people. I mean, Lauren, you remember when I went through the phase of hosting, I was hosting things, I, I was know. on camera. Mm -hmm. I, I even started talking like Ira Glass from This American Life. I took on this whole persona. 
try different things in college and some of them work and some of them don't. Yeah, but it was fun, but we had so much fun. And with the collaboration, we worked together so often that we kind of could read each other's minds. Right. And, you know, even on set with looking at the image and knowing what we're going to change and knowing to get him a blueberry muffin and coffee. Mm -hmm. and his coffee is on a different level. I can't get that kind of coffee. Is here. it that bulletproof? The uh... No, oh. Rick, let's yeah. get into it. No, just like a single origin Ethiopian pour over will do. That's all. Yeah, that's all. I don't know if Boost Video has that. Um, I don't even know if you can get that here at Bell Works. I know. I don't know. So I'm like, I don't Maybe. Know. I'm sure. They yeah. probably renamed it, but you could ask them for that. Ming just okay. said officially yes. Oh, oh, cool. I thought so. That's awesome. But yeah, the collaboration is a huge, important piece. I mean, even doing so many different projects, you know, yeah. I love that I can communicate to him the feel and what I would like. And then he works through Lauren, come on, mm -hmm. like, let's do this or that. When I'm like, give me sparkles, Lauren. And, and I think I really, that comes back into the collaboration aspect. And I think Rich, Rick, that the important thing is that you're able to, when you're doing something, you have a uh, complete understanding. Obviously you want to make it look as beautiful as it needs to be and carry out that goal. But you also understand what the editor wants. You want, yeah. you know, there's, that's, mm -hmm. that's a big deal that gets lost. Sure. Yeah. The edit, what the editor wants, what the director wants, but ultimately like what do the, you know, if it's a narrative, what do the actors want out of their characters? What are they trying to do? And how does this tie into that larger picture? You know, on some, some days you can't spend all day setting up one perfect, beautiful shot. Right. Because the beauty in the end might not be your cinematography. It might be the performance or it might be the way this is all cut together or it might be the, what the production designer has done with the place. So just like kind of keeping that in the back of your mind at all times as a cinematographer, I think is really helpful. That's great. I think it was last year. So, you know, we have the student portion of the Gordon State Film Festival and your high school teacher, I didn't realize it was your high school teacher. I forget what he emailed something and I was like, oh my God. So we were talking about how great you are and he was very proud of you also. And like everything that you've, you've created this far and everything but it was just so random that i don't even know how we were talking about you but i was like oh my god I love him yeah, mr castellina yeah we took you under our wing and just continued to give you the tools and really great gear yeah yeah i mean so mr castellina when i was in high school he he knew that i was really interested in shooting more so than some of the other people in the class and he would he let me take gear home over the summer and I made a short film with it. He let me take lights home and at the time a Canon GL2. And the same was kind of true at Brookdale. Like if I said that I had some ambitious project mm -hmm. outside of class that I just wanted to take on, everyone at Brookdale always supported that and gave me, you know, either helped me out with mm -hmm. their time, gave me advice, or would allow me to use gear to go make that happen. And, you know, that that's like a really important thing to have that time to make mistakes. You right. could do the projects that you get in class over and over again. And, you know, maybe you'll make a mistake and your professor will tell you the mistake you made, but like you need some time on your own to, you know, create creative things. And even as a young kid, you could buy a bunch of camera gear and, and do that, but, or you could go somewhere that might help you have access to some of that gear. Well, one of the things I was going to just compliment Brookdale again is in, in that the size of the school and stuff like that, that gives you that ability um, where there's a personal connection and they also understand yeah. they want to nurture that connection, mm -hmm. nurture that student, give you that ability. And then yeah. a lot of bigger schools, and I'm not beating them up. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit more, it's lost and a little more systematic in a way. No, you can't, no, we can't do that. You know? Right. And we provide a lot of hands-on experience. And so it's kind of, upsetting to me when I hear our students transfer to other four-year institutions in New Jersey, you know, North Jersey, <laughs> Mop County. Um, and so, you know, they're pretty upset because once they get there, they're ready to go and there's nothing for them to right. like do. And Brookdale, right. we have a 24 seven uh, peg access channel. So what our students produce actually airs on right. television. So um, yeah, so that's great. And we're very proud of you. I can't say that without smiling. Um, and also, I mean, we're talking about these shorts that you're doing, but 
you know, you have such great professional experience producing commercials like Cindy Crawford and um, what's her name and all these other interviews. So you, I love that you can do documentaries, you can do interviews for whatever, like not TMZ, I forget whatever they were, but um, it's very vast. Like, you know, your experience and your work is so beautiful that you can go like this week, go from a feature film and then next week go to doing interviews, you know, in New York or yeah, I, travel. I think that's, yeah. Like, traveling. They send him traveling a lot. Yeah. I mean, I just try to keep myself busy. I'm unfortunately a person that doesn't do uh, very well if I have nothing going on, which has made this year particularly pretty difficult. Um, I've been lucky to have a few projects this year, but, um, I just have this desire to just keep shooting and I love shooting like documentaries. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to try to avoid narratives because I really thought there was something like fake in setting up lighting as a mm -hmm. cinematographer. I mean, you're in charge of lighting everything. And I struggled with trying not to make it too like artificial, but over the past two or three years, I've kind of found a balance where I can shoot narratives in a very documentary way, mm -hmm. uh, lighting more naturalistically and, um, you know, but then some days you have to pull out all the stops and, and overlight something for a commercial project. And that's just kind of finding whatever the project demands, never being stuck to one, you know, approach or one, you know, specific type of equipment. You know, you kind of have to look at the project. I think it's also, you know, Rick, that one gives you the ability to do the others uh, all the time too. You do that commercial, that big commercial where you're lighting it and maybe it's a little bit more just giving them what they want in a sense, even though infusing your style into it, but it just gives you that ability to uh, do those things that you're passionate about as well. And the, the film that you know, is, is yeah. that is a representation. It's brilliant. I'm always like, come on, enter it. So they do so <laughs> many. I'm like, don't. Don't publicly show it. Yes. Yeah, it's really tough. I mean, because as a cinematographer, a lot of times when I'll I'll finish on a project, it's out of my hands. I don't have control over it. Um, I have four projects right now that I'm just waiting to show the world. I have no control over, you know, the post-production. I was just... Oh, yeah. Actually, have, five projects that are just stuck in, you know, post-production limbo. I mean, some of them are pretty close, but... You All right, well, gotta we're going to open names. submissions. This year, I think we're going to open it earlier, May 1st. Mm -hmm. I really want to close prior to yeah, December yeah, 1st. Yeah. It's just too crazy. <clears throat> it does. So I don't know when they'll be finished, but... I don't know either. GSFF 2022. Oh, what? Mm -hmm. It's our 20th, 20th anniversary. anniversary. Wow. Let's yeah, do it. 20 years. Nice. Oh, and yeah, we'll see you in Asbury Park, Rick. You're coming to Asbury Park, yes? Yeah, I'll be there. Fantastic. Yeah, we're super excited. We need tons of B-roll, especially on Friday. Yes. And uh, then I love working, you know. I know you love work. <laughs> no, but you can hang out too. Yeah, you got to hang out a little. Yeah. Well, the camera does attract a lot of attention. A lot of people do come up to me and talk. Yeah. Talk shop. And know. we do great B-roll. And then Sunday we're going to live stream Sunday. Cool. So, it's up I'll talk to you offline about all that jazz but we're super excited and we can't thank you enough for sharing your work like i'm not just being your number one fan <laughs> um but seriously it's important for you know we have filmmakers that are starting out we have very experienced and seasoned filmmakers and i love that you can go to one film block at the garden state film festival and see so many different things. You know, you can see a music video, a short documentary like what you have, a feature, and it's just really fantastic that there's all this opportunity for us to be the platform right. for independent filmmakers. And and I go back to this. We were talking about this before. You know, everybody has that story to tell. And the great yeah. thing about yours is it's a great story. You know, that's what you do for independent filmmakers. The film, so the film festival does. It gives them a platform. Yeah. A platform to tell their story and also to have their story seen because, um, you know, something like your production, you, people have to see that story. Yeah. We're super excited to share it. And Rick, so if you could talk to your past life self, just kidding. What, uh, uh, what advice do you have? <laughs> we were talking about time travel. Time travel. Yeah. What advice do you have for our student 
filmmakers who are just kind of sprouting and figuring out life and cameras and the menus, how everything now is about the menu. Oh, I would tell them to not worry so much about the gear and focus right. really on what it is that they want to show the world and what they want to say with their work. Um, and also that the most important part of the process is is meeting people that you collaborate well with. I mean, with this project, Hunter is, you know, somebody who I met on set. I mean, Lauren, you were there the day that I met Hunter. You guys I, I would have right. never, I would have never guessed that, you know, five or six years later, right. he's not only one of my best friends, but all of my best work has been created with him. Yep. I love him as an editor. And that's rare for me to say that I like yep. when he's editing. Right. Yeah. So I could have had any camera. But what really made this project special and other projects was meeting and collaborating with someone who you think alike with. You both have the same view on the world. You both have the same kind of voice. So it it just helps so much. I could have never edited all this footage into something as complete as this project. I could tell you that every time I shoot something and he edits it, yeah, it comes back and my jaw drops. I just can't even believe it, you know, because I might see these images when I'm shooting them, but it's not. I don't see them this way, the way that he right. sees them. I love it, too. It's like a beautiful, like, I can feel it, not just watch it. I really love it. Yeah. I haven't seen him in a while, but I'll be with you on Friday. I didn't tell oh, yeah. Ming yet. <laughs> cool. Cool. Um, all right, so don't be obsessed with the gear. Any other tips to our filmmaker friends? Um, I would say that find what it is you want to specialize in. Um, if you want to be a director, pursue directing. If you want to be a cinematographer, pursue that. If you want to be an editor, pursue that. Um, and you can go online now, and there's forums and different places that you could get direct access to some of the best people in the business and just ask them a question. I mean, the best living cinematographer right now has a forum and he answers your questions. You could ask him anything and he'll answer your okay. question. So, oh, awesome. you know, you, there's so many different opportunities out there to ask people. Everybody has a podcast. We're on a podcast right now, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. There's so much access to information, whereas, you know, you used to have to buy magazines yeah that's true oh my gosh whenever yeah. i put them in the mail i would leave them for him yeah you would always give me the international cinematography guild magazine. yeah and canon yeah gosh our life is amazing together you would save the bnh book for me i know wow I would. That. that's special it is um well we're super excited and by the way your film is playing at the asbury lane so here's a little weird little thing the Asbury okay. Lanes is in person, right? Except for your film block. I'm really sorry. That's okay. We have another event at that time. So on Saturday, 115 to 345, it's internet, the World Wide Web, on the line only. Mm -hmm. For that film block, it's called AL5. Visit gsff.org and go to the schedule and look for AL5. What does AL5 mean, Lauren? It means Asbury Lanes 5. So when you go to our ticketing, we have over 58 film blocks so we number them so it keeps it simple and we know what the heck's going on but we're thrilled 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 and i can't wait to see hunter again i don't know when that will happen and rick you have to promise us that you're going to continue to submit to the gordon state film festival sure and get yeah i think this is like the fifth year in a row i've had something in there maybe even I know. longer i think it might be longer it all blurs together yeah, me. Yeah. yeah. And then also the volunteers we have from Brookdale and outside of Brookdale stick with us. So we have a lot of the same volunteers and everyone working with us for 19 years. And I'm so glad that you're one of them. Well, thank you. I can't wait to see everybody again. I know. Me too. So we're super thrilled. For more information, go to gsff.org. Um, you can see RC Bandit at Instagram to see his beautiful photos. And no, I'm not just saying that. Um, David, thank you so much for being with us. And we will see you in Asbury Park, March 23rd to the 28th. See it's, you later. It's going to be fun. <laughs>